All right, new format, new everything. Hello and welcome back to Rupal Breaks the Tears List based off of a Goosebumps book or story or whatever, because I love me my Goosebumps. Sorry, I'm just making sure my phone doesn't fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> and I'm drinking my delicious bang to make sure I have plenty of energy for this video. Drink it. Uh, but this time around, we're... um. Ranking the first ten stories on the uh, the tales to give you goosebumps. This book, to be exact, I have all six of the books. I'm going to be ranking every single one, but I'm doing them in order just because. Hey, why not? Originally, I was going to do it all at once, but I was like, "Nap, let's make this a nice six-part video." Because hey, why not? It's I want views. I gotta have it. Also, hopefully this angle's good for you. I think I look beautiful in this angle. Uh, but hey, I started off with the Tales to Give You Goosebumps. This one has The House of No Return, Teacher's Pet, Strained Peas, Strangers in the Woods, Good Friends, How I Won My Bat, Mr. Teddy, Click, Broken Dolls, and A Vampire in the Neighborhood. Now, I'm not ranking them on how good they are. No. We're gonna rank them how a true Goosebumps list should be ranked. How scary they are. Yeah, we're not talking about quality here. We're talking about quality of scares. Ooh, that's right. Spookies. Uh, so, you know, without further ado, let's actually change. You know, like I always do, I have to change the names of these. So let's make S tier too scary for me. Me. All right, that's good. A kind of creepy, creepy paper. Creepy paper. It's crepe paper. Creepy paper. Crepe paper, master? Um, because why not? Kind of creepy, sponsor this. Uh, let's go with mild goose bumps ach achieved. There you go. Yeah, mild goose bumps achieved. Mm. Yawn. Yawn. Yeah. And D tier. Ah. No nightmares tonight. Bam. Okay. All right. Let's start off with the House of No Return. Uh, I have a couple brief descriptions of it for y'all. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be reading it off my phone because I'm, I'm cool and have have it right here. I'm so cool like that. I'm cool like that. I just need to reposition it. <laughs> Good job, Chris. So, the House of No Return, Robbie, Laurie, and Nathan are part of a club called the Danger Club, of which they are the only members and pride themselves on being the boldest children they know. They will take any dare they are offered. They become interested in Chris Wakely, a new boy in town, and encourage him to join them. They dare him to spend an hour in the House of No Return, Ooh. a boarded up old house which none of the local children will enter because it is rumored to be haunted. He is not very brave and declines. However, they are desperate for him to join. On Halloween night, they trick him and force him inside the house. An hour later, Chris has still not returned. Eventually, the club reluctantly goes inside to look for him. The door seals shut behind them, so they cannot escape. Then the two ghosts come down the stairs. They explain that Chris came to the house some time ago, but they allowed him to go because he promised that three ch three other children would be following him. They also say that now Robbie, Laurie, and Nathan will stay in the house forever. That's pretty fucking funny to me. <laughs> uh, now, why is this story scary? Um, uh, you know what? Example one on my thing is literally the first page describing the titular house. Which, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and read it off. Because why not? This is, this is for rating and reviewing. I can read an excerpt from this story. It's reading and reviewing. It's cool. All the cool people do it. We were afraid to go too close to the house. So we stayed down at the street, staring up at it, staring across the bare, sloping front yard. No grass would grow in that yard. The trees, gnarled and bent, were all dead. 
Not even weeds sprouted in the dry, cracked dirt. At the top of the sloping yard, the house seemed to stare back at us. The two upstairs windows gaped like two unblinking black eyes. The house was wide and solid looking, built of bricks. Many years ago, the bricks had been painted white, but now the paint was faded and peeling. Spots of red brick showed through like blood stains. Mm. Uh, the, the window shutters were cracked. Several had fallen off. The beams of the front porch tilted dangerously. A strong wind could blow that porch over. No one lived there. The house had been empty for years and years. That's some good prose! I was about to say, Stein's not the greatest at prose, but when he does do it for like some, for like a spooky location, it'll send a shiver down your spine. It works here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next part that's really scary for me that I put on my list was when they're trick-or-treating and suddenly they, they, see the thing is, they force Chris. They're not like, they're just not, they're not just like, hey Chris, uh, you're gonna go in the house now. No, they force him and they grab him. They are like, it, it's just fucking scary what they're doing. They're, like the terror that Chris shows helps convey this and just the, Danger Club just flat out refusing, refusing to listen to Chris's pleas to come in with him. It, it, it's kind of sociopathic because it's for their own gain. It's just for them, for them to get a new member instead of being like, oh, you know what? You can join our club. You don't have to go in here. No, you have to do this because we're fucking demented. It's, it's pretty messed up, honestly. And it's pretty scary. And the ending is pretty... Most of these short stories have pretty solid scary endings. I'd say maybe it's like a 50-50, actually. <laughs> Meh, give or take. Some are pretty scary, some are like, eh. This one, this one's a pretty solid one. Mostly because of the descriptions of the ghost. Uh, let, let's go ahead and read the read that page. Page 14 in, uh, in my edition. That's, that's all like it matters, right? The shimmering cloud spread around us, and inside it, I saw two frightening figures. A ghostly man and woman. Hazy and transparent, except for their red, glowing eyes. Their terrifying eyes sparkled like fiery coals as they circled us, floating silently. Good description! I like the cold red eyes. Uh, and, um, don't worry. Th then he ruins this this whole entire thing. Uh, I wouldn't say the whole thing's ruined, but it, it, has, it has a bit of humor there. Uh, it, has, it has that Stein humor at the end. Don't look so frightened, kids. The woman rasped, floating closer. You might as well make yourselves at home. You're all going to be here forever. It's cheesy. It's good cheese, though. Not bad cheese. Some, sometimes R.O. will have some pretty bad cheese. Um, now, now, some things that make this story not so scary. Uh, an obvious figure on page two... It, it's so bad. I, I just have to read it. I'm not going to be going to the book every single time. This one just happened to have a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff I had to read. <laughs> I turned and saw a light roaming silently over the street, coming towards us. A white, ghostly light. My breath caught in my throat. It's a car. It's a fucking car. It's not scary when you give it away that it's just a car. It wasn't scary to begin with. And let's let's just not let, let's just admit that the Dangerous Club con the Danger Club's constant complaining about needing members is annoying and it takes away from the fear. Like I mean for reals, like you have the ability to be like, okay, let's add some new members. Maybe let's do something different. You know, jump, jump off the bridge that's not going to break your leg or something. I don't know. That's that's dangerous, right? Eh? My final verdict. I rather enjoy this story. And it only has the one fake out to take away from the scares. Anytime there's a description of the house, it paints a wonderfully macabre image in your head. I think there are scary stories than this one, but this is a good one to start things off with. You know, it's it's not too scary, but it's got some good spooks in there. It's almost, it's, it's, it's bordering on a too scary five me or a kind of creepy, but I'm leaning towards a high kind of creepy though. 
Uh, the story isn't the tightest. There's too much of the Danger Club complaining, like I said already. And... Yeah, I wish they were in the house a little bit longer. Like, I think if they were in the house a little bit longer, we'd have some really good scares. I mean, it's a ghost house! Let's get some spook -em ups going! Come on! Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm gonna put this one... Kinda creepy. Yeah. Kinda creepy. Cause it's kinda creepy. Like, let's not lie. Ghost, ghost parents? Scary. Ghost dad? Terrifying. Bang. Sponsor this video, please. I love this flavor. Okay, continuing on with Teacher's Pet. It's Teacher's Pet. Da -da -ba -ba. I, don't, I don't know the words to the theme song to Teacher's Pet. I just like the movie. It's a good movie. I like the show, too. It's good. I like Nathan Lane. The man is talented motivator. Okay, Teacher's Pet. Two best friends named Becca Thompson and Benji Connor. Uh, Benji, what is he, a dog? Benji to the rescue here. Go save some fucking mountain lions or something. Benji. Fuck it. <laughs> um, uh, they're in, uh, okay, they're, they're in for another year in school. Hoping to get their old teacher. Uh, but they're shocked to find they have a new teacher, Mr. Blakenship. Who has his own page on the Goosebumps wiki, I might add. A rather eccentric fellow who appears to love snakes, which both Becca and Benji fear. And is keeping several tanks of them in their classroom, along with a tank he keeps supplied with live mice to feed them with. Becca grows to dislike Mr. Blakenship, especially when he makes the whole class stay after school after a student inadvertently releases a mouse. That's not right. That's that's not the right description, actually. I, I took these from the Goosebumps wiki. Uh, Spongy, fix this. That's not what happened. No, they had to write a three-page essay, if I'm not mistaken. So, And that's pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> when he makes her clean out the... Oh, God. God, when he makes her clean out the snake tanks after she gets into trouble with him. Wow, this is a really... Wait, oh wait. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Yeah, yeah, this is really poorly written. I'm sorry. I should edit this myself a little bit. I, I should stop complaining and do something with myself. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> nah. Uh, but yeah, um, Becca gets in trouble, so she has to... She's being forced to clean the snake tanks. Um, she decides to get even and persuades Benji into agreeing to help her. They sneak into the school after hours and let all the mice out of their tank, only to get the shock of their lives when the biggest snake in the tanks gets out and suddenly morphs into Mr. Blankenship. That's right, he's an anamorph. Yeah! That's the scariest part. <laughs> uh, apparently their new teacher is revealed to be a snake in human form. You can change back at will. He agrees not to sn snack on them or tell anybody about their about their breaking into the school and freeing his mice, as long as they promise to keep his secret and feed him a mouse a day, knowing that nobody will ever believe them. They're forced to agree. What is he, Bill Murray? <laughs> uh, okay, why is this one scary? There's a nightmare sequence. Usually, nightmare sequences and and, and fake outs in gruesome stories are not that good. They, they tend to like take away from the story, they tend to be too long, or just like, it, it makes you go, oh, really? For reals? But I like this one. I think this is a pretty decent one, which I'll go ahead and read. It, it's on page 19 here. <laughs> do, 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 do. One night, I was lying in bed, trying to get to sleep. Pale moonlight washed over my room from the open window. I saw a shadow move against the wall. Uttering a frightened gasp, I clicked on my bed table lamp and saw a snake slithering out of my backpack on the floor. Ooh. How had it escaped from its tank? How had it crept into my backpack? Frozen in terror, I watched it slither over my shag rug, making its way to my bed. I screamed and forced myself to sit up. I tried to scramble away, but I felt something warm and dry curl around my arm. Uh. <sighs> I was making this weird gasping sound. I felt something like a rope tightening around my ankle. Another snake slithered over my pillow. Two more snakes crawled over my pajama legs. 
Help! My frantic plea escaped my lips in a hushed whisper. The snakes tightened themselves around me, curling around my waist, my arms, my legs. One of them slivered through my hair. I started to shudder and shake. I shook so hard I woke myself up. What a horrible nightmare. What a horrible nightmare indeed. Uh, I think that was pretty good. I mean, it's, I mean, this character clearly is afraid of snakes. It's it's displayed right there. Uh, well, I'm not afraid of snakes, personally. Uh, I think the idea of being in a classroom filled with an animal you're afraid of is a scary concept. But let's, let's not lie to ourselves. Like, I'm not afraid of snakes. I live in Arizona. We, we have a lot of snakes here. Hell, we went swimming uh, this past Monday. And let's go, like, at night as well. And we were just walking back to the apartment, and it's like, oh, look, a snake just slithered by. Adorable little guy. Probably out to go eat some crickets or something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, not afraid of him. Uh, when they find out Mr. Blankenship's secret and the day that follows of them wondering how he'll punish them, there's some good tension there. Like, they're just, like, waiting for him to be like, oh, I'm coming to get you, you know, something like that, but no, nothing happens until the very end, and then, but then here comes, here, oh no, I, I scrolled down the wrong part, uh, the, the, the ending's a stinker, like, why isn't this story scary, this ending is, is just bad, I, I, I have to read this ending, because it's so freaking bad, Mr. Blankenship isn't such a bad guy, he made us a deal. He said he wouldn't tell anyone we broke into the school, and he promised not to harm us as long as we didn't tell anyone his secret. It's just like, okay, friendly monster time. It's just so weird. Like, honestly, I was kind of hoping of a... I was very much hoping for, like, a... Yo, children. It's a shame I have to eat you now. You know, something like that. Anything. Anything spooky. This wasn't spooky. It was lame. Lame. It was lame. Um, also, I'll just say it again. Not afraid of snakes. So that's not scary for me. Final verdict. While snakes can be scary for a child, as an adult, this story doesn't work for me. Maybe if I had a sphere of snakes, it would work, but it just doesn't. I wish we had more time with snake form Mr. Blakenship. Maybe see him as a half snake, half man form versus just giant cobra. Like, I thought that was so weird. They, he was like, it's a giant cobra in that tank. Oh no, it's Mr. Blankenship. Okay. This one falls flat for me. And in all honesty, I'm going to go yawn. Not spooky enough. Sorry, Charlie. Strained peas. I... <laughs> Nicholas isn't excited about the idea of having a baby sister. While he waits for his parents to come home with the baby, he reads an Iron Man comic book where he fights a villain with a mark of evil. That gives him away. His mother arrives home from the hospital with the baby. Baby Hannah! Nicholas notices that Hannah has a similar mark as the villain in the story, but his parents write it off. Strange things start to happen around the house regarding Hannah. Her eyes change color. Her heart-shaped birthmark grows, and she and she eats his homework. He comes to believe that Hannah is a monster, despite his, despite his parents' assurances that there is perfectly normal explanation for everything. Things come to a head when Hannah attempts to stab him with scissors, but instead Mom scolds Nicholas for allowing her to get near them to begin with. Eventually, it is discovered that while in the hospital, Hannah was accidentally switched at birth with the boy's real sister. And she is not... Oh, wait, wait. And she is not related to him at all. She is returned to the hospital, and they get their real baby. Who well, they then name Grace. Uh, she seems totally normal. When Nick's parents put Grace to bed, Nick gets up to get, go tickle her. Grace gets angry and says, If you tickle me again, kid, I'll rip your arm off. As Nick flees, he hears her say, I'll get rid of you, creep. Just wait until I can walk. <laughs> okay. Why is this story scary? One word. Baby. Babies are scary. I'm almost in my 30s. I don't like babies. They're gross. Nah. I'm willing to adopt, but not a baby. Not the baby. Yeah, no, no babies. They're, they're icky, gross germ factories. Oh. 
I mean, that goes for children in general, but I, I don't like babies. I don't like them. Do not like them. So, another thing that's scary in this story, the idea of having the wrong baby with you and having to give back the child you've cared for for so long, that's real adult fear. Like, like, like holy crap. Like, the mother is crying. Like, she is, like, broken by this concept. She is falling in love with this child, but is being forced to return it. But the scariness of it, the, the, the adult fear of it all, kind of gets ruined when freaking Nicholas is like, yippee, and jumping for joy. <laughs> like, it's it, it's honestly a good moment, and really, like, makes you go, holy crap. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty decent. It's a pretty decent adult fear. Uh, not one that I would hope I would ever have, but it's it's decent little adult fear. Let's like let's not lie to ourselves. Now, why isn't it scary? Uh, baby ate my homework. <laughs> that was so freaking funny. <laughs> oh, it was just too funny. I was laughing so hard when he was like, "She ate my homework." <laughs> Look, I don't know why I think that's so funny. Uh, Nicholas's delusions about Hannah get obnoxious. The whole story is based around events where she does something and he says one thing and no one listens to him. And just that whole concept is just so boring and long and just, it goes on and on. And I just don't like the, she did this, but everyone's like, she's a baby. I've never liked that kind of story trope. Like, I don't even know what you'd call that. Uh, son of the mass syndrome? I don't know. Don't like it. Don't care for it. Not one bit. No, sir, I don't like it. Oh, and that ending. The ending where the baby's talking to him. So bad. I think it's... You know what? It's worse than the TV show episode, but we're not going to talk about the TV show episodes. You know, I'm, I'm going to save that for another day. But uh, my final verdict... Another good one for childhood fears, like growing, be, getting, becoming a sibling is a weird fear, but an understandable one. It's like you're being put, you're, you're, you're being given responsibility that you don't want. And it, it, it's weird. I don't know. It's, it's just one of those ones that I never had to have because I, I was the baby. God love me. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just, um. Yeah, it, it, it feels like you're not loved as much when the baby arrives and you become that kid. Uh, it, it kind of reminds me of the Rugrats movie, you know, of just the, oh, I'm being forgotten, and this baby is now the, the, the main center of my parents' attention. Tears. Just tears. Um, yeah, and the only part that really worked for me was the switched at birth thing, really. Like, in all honesty, like, th this one's not that scary. It's not that scary. I, I, it, I ain't having no, I ain't get, got no nightmares for this one. That ain't no nightmares. Bye. Uh, yes, yeah, pour string these in. If you're wondering why the S is cut off, it's because I'm terrible at making tier lists. I'll learn eventually. Eventually. All right, next up, Strangers in the Woods. Ooh. Terrible title for this one. I'm, I'm just going to say it. I don't think this is a good title. I thought this was a different story, in all honesty. I thought this was actually one of the stories from um, the, the More Tales to Give You Goosebumps, because that sounds like one of those ones, but whatever. We're not here to talk about More Tales to Give You Goosebumps. That's, that's next episode. Uh, a girl named Lucy is staying with her great-aunt Abigail, while her parents are in Asia. Why couldn't she bring them? Why couldn't they bring her? I don't know. Lucy soon discovers that some of her great-aunt's specialties are slightly different. Along with her usual slow, calm driving... Her dog has also been acting weirder than usual. Lucy then takes her dog, Mutster. Greatest name for a dog. I love that name, Mutster. Uh, <laughs> for a walk. Uh, except Great Aunt Abigail warns Lucy to stay out of the woods. When last year, Great Aunt Abigail had no problems with Lucy going into the forest. Uh, Lucy then starts seeing bright lights in the sky uh, at night. Uh, Lucy soon expects that the lights are signs of aliens. Lucy also starts to expect that the reason her dog is barking so much is because of Mudster's sixth sense, which makes Lucy believe that Great Aunt Abigail has been possessed by an alien. To prove that she is right, Lucy goes into the forest. She, find, she then finds out that the reason for the lights is because there is a movie being shot in the forest. 
Uh, Great Aunt Abigail then explains that she has been acting so... Why she has been acting so weird is because she lost her glasses. Duh, she's an old person. She needs her glasses. Duh. Uh, <laughs> Dumb. Uh, right before Lucy goes to bed, she finds her great aunt's glasses. She then goes to return them, only to find out that her great aunt Abigail is indeed an alien. <laughs> Why is this story scary? You know what? This is something Stein probably didn't did did not purposely do, but I feel like he accidentally wrote something really good for it. Is the idea of an older relative that is changing right? You know, like. Just, just novel ideas of just like, like little, little details about them are like slightly changing, you know, maybe even slight dementia kind of thing. Like, I don't know if that's really what he was aiming for. I really doubt it. It's R.L. Stein we're speaking about. As much as I love the guy, he does not write stories with nu nuance. He says it himself. He, he writes stories to entertain. Damn it, he does it. Um... Yeah, but yeah, this is like a legit fear of like, you know, like an older relative like that's changing and you're kind of like, oh wow, they're different and like there's something off, you know, they're changing for the worse. It, it's, it's, it's a weird fear. I don't know how to, how to explain it really. It's it's definitely with older relative kind of thing, you know, like you, you think you see like your grandmother and she's like starting to do stuff that's like really weird, you know, stuff like that. And... um yeah, yeah, I, I guess the idea of the attack of the pod people kind of thing, you know, people being changed, because she has this fear that people are being changed and stuff, that's slightly scary, I wouldn't say it's like the scariest concept, I think it's kind of outdated, let's not, let's, let's, let's not lie to ourselves, it's a very outdated, very kind of gross trope, yeah, we're not going to get into that, but uh, if you want, if you need to know more, Read a book. I don't know what book, but read a book. I like books. Uh, and you know what? I kind of like this ending. I think the ending description of Aunt Abigail is pretty good. I think she's she's kind of creepy. And um, but something I don't find too scary is the whole lights thing in the distance. There's just not enough description there to make me go, "Ooh, that's spooky" or anything like that. I'm just like. Okay, there's lights in the woods. Someone having a mattress sale? <laughs> That's what it feels like. Uh, final verdict, I'm kind of torn on this one. It's really not that scary of a story. The whole pod people thing doesn't work when it's just one person acting weird. And the big reveal at the end that they're filming a movie isn't the best twist. But Alien Grant, Great Aunt Abigail is a solid Stein spooky ending. I don't think it's a, it's a yawn. But I think it's a mild Goosebumps Achieved one. But, like, if anyone else gets in this section, it's gonna get, like, moved over here. It's gonna get moved over. Yeah. It's gonna get moved over. For sure. For sure. Good friends. Dylan and his friend Jordan are hanging after school. The two boys see Jordan's younger sister, Ashley, talking to an imaginary friend. Jordan makes fun of her, and Ashley runs away. Dylan's older brother, Richard, demands that Dylan come inside and do his homework. Dylan lies and says that he's done his homework, and Jordan asks Dylan why he lets his brother boss him around. That night, while Dylan is trying to do homework, Jordan comes up with a plan to release Richard's pet tarantulas in the hopes of scaring Ashley. The boys steal Richard's spiders and walk outside. Richard storms out, yelling at Dylan. Richard calls Dylan an embarrassment because he likes playing with imaginary friends. It's kind of a weird story, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, why is it scary? In the story, it, it's very much kind of like said that the, the older brother, uh, um, Richard, is like really mean and abusive to Dylan. Like, I'm like, I'm like, and calling him an embarrassment? Those are some, that's, that's pretty brutal right there. Like, that's mean. That's really mean. But that's a good, like, insult, if you ask me. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, that's a, that's a good insult. But at the same time, it's like, you shouldn't be telling your brother he's an embarrassment for having imaginary friends. Like, and, and like, the implications of why Dylan has imaginary friends is 
it, it, is something we can honestly ponder about for a while. Like, uh, my guess is, like, he does this because he, of the abuse he suffers from his older brother, and he wants to create these imaginary friends so that he can have some semblance of power. Because, you know, him and the friend are about to pick on the little sister who also has imaginary friends. And he's making fun of her, like, or that friend's making, the, the, the imaginary friend is making fun of the imaginary friend's sister for having imaginary friends. Imaginary friends, imaginary friends, imaginary friends. Oh my lord. Like, it, it's it's kind of crazy, you know, when you think about it. Kind of spoopy. Kind of spooky. Now, why is this one not scary? I'll give you one reason. The tarantulas in the story, you want to know their names? Axel and Foley. That's right. You may know him as, uh, you know, the Beverly Hills Cop. You know, you, you, you know Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Bev, Bev, Beverly Hills Cop. Bev, Bev, Beverly Hills Cop. Axel Foley's coming to get you. Bow, bow. Um, it's not really why it's not scary. I think that's just funny. It did make me chuckle. It did kind of take me out of the story for a little bit there, but not enough to really... I, I just had to, I had to include that because I thought that was so funny. Uh, final verdict for this one. I remember reading this one a while back and kind of just skimming over it because it seemed a bit weird. It really confused me when I first read it. Uh, but upon rereading it, though, I have to admit it's a decent psychological little thriller in short form. Not necessarily the scariest, but I'd say it's kind of creepy. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to put it, uh, I'm going to say right behind House of No Returns. I think House of No Returns is a bit scarier, but Good Friends is kind of creepy. Like, it's it's good. I, I, got, I ain't going to lie. Kind of creepy, man. <sighs> Seriously. Bang, bang! Okay. How I Won My Bet. Michael Mike Burns, that's how it's written. I think it's funny. Uh, is useless at baseball. <laughs> that is not a great description to start off the book. He's actually really, he's actually the, the, the what's it called? The, the star hitter, but he starts getting bad of it. Uh, he is a... That's not the right description of the story at all. Okay, Mike is the is, is like the the big big hitter guy. I, I can't remember what they use this use in the book, but he he's he's like kind of lost that ability to hit the ball properly, and he's kind of being embarrassed. He's 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 scared of being the failure because they're about to be at the playoffs to be number one, and he is scared to play because he's been he's he's become a fuck up. That's why that's not a lie. That's that's the polite way of putting it. He is approached by a man named Mr. Smith who offers to lend him a magical bat that will enable him to win a forthcoming game. There's one condition. As soon as the game is finished, he must go straight back and return the bat to the sports museum, of which Mr. Smith is in charge. Soon enough, Mike hits every home run and his team wins the game. Uh, Mike wants to go home now, but remembers he must go to the museum. Actually, he doesn't want to go home. He actually wants to go to Pat's Pizza Parlor, if I'm not mistaken. But, see there, right there, there. Uh, can that be a new location in the Goosebumps game? P uh, Pat's Pizza Parlor? Pat's Pizza Parlor. Pat's Pizza Parlor. Pa, 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 pa. I want pizza. I don't want pizza. I had pizza yesterday. Uh, but pizza is the best. There, Mike finds many realistic-looking statues posing with sports equipment and is odd. When Mr. Smith asks him about the bat... Mike becomes desperate and pleads to be allowed to keep it. Mr. Smith agrees and asks him to stand in a spot for a couple of seconds with the bats. Actually, he tells him to take some swings, you know, just to show him. Uh, and Mike obliges and takes a swing with the bat. Immediately, there's a bright flash of light and Mike is frozen to the spot as a life-size model. He remains in the museum for months, or even years, as he has lost all sense of time. People who come to the museum often pass by the exhibit and admire his swing, which he is pleased about. Mike realizes that an, realizes another benefit to the situation. Now he really will be able to keep the bat forever. Uh, why is it scary? The fear of failure coming from a star player. Not, you know, it's it's not it's not a real fear for me, but it's a fear for those kiddos, right? <laughs> Yep, nothing like failing in the eyes of your friends and family and your coach and everyone else. And I failed you all. Uh, 
Uh, why isn't the story scary? The, this is this is it's it's a double edged sword on this one. This is it kind of ties into the why is it scary and why is it not scary. It's like it, it's a double edged sword type, double edged sword, um, because this is a be careful what you wish for story, and Stein usually fumbles on these ones like when he did in the literal story be careful what you wish for uh but in this one i think he succeeds but at the same time i'm not a huge fan of this trope so it kind of takes me away when, when when i'm not a fan of something it takes away for me but i think i like i like this i like how this one is executed though i like the idea that he's like please let me keep the bat and he gets to keep it forever but he's forever frozen in place with it which is such a weird idea but it's it's good. It's spooky. It's spooky. It's spooky. I, I say it's so spooky. That is it's spooky. Um, final verdict though. The realistic fear of failure is used quite well in this story, and the ending twist works very well for the story. I wouldn't say this is the scary story, scariest story he's ever written, but it plays with the common fear most people will encounter in life. I think this is one deserves to be placed firmly in the middle as a mild goosebumps. Uh, just achieved. It's definitely going above Strangers in the Woods. Like, Strangers has some good mild mild goosebumps, but this one's got me a little more goosebumped out. Alright. Mr. Teddy. Oh, Mr. Teddy. Willa is spoiled. Gina, Willa's older sister, accuses her mother of being too indulgent with Willa. Despite this, when Willa asks her mother for a teddy bear, she gets it. Willa takes the bear home, she names the toy Mr. Teddy, and puts it on her bed, replacing her old teddy bear. Um, old bear. I don't think that's the same. Uh, after spending one night with the bear, Willa wakes up to find that the toy has moved closer to the window. She suspects that her sister may have moved it. You may have heard this story before. I don't know. A night with a dummy or something. I don't, I don't fucking know. I don't, I don't read no dumb goosebump books. It's a lie. I read them. Often. Uh, <laughs> the next night, Willa makes sure to hold Mr. Teddy firmly as she falls asleep. When she wakes up, she finds that two of her decorative porcelain eggs are broken. Mr. Teddy is propped up next to the shattered trinkets. Willa looks for Gina, prepared to scold her, but she's already left for school. When Gina comes home at the end of the day, she denies breaking the eggs. That night, Willa tucks Mr. Teddy firmly into bed with her. However, when she awakens the following morning, she is so, she is shocked. So shocked. Uh, Mr. Teddy has moved once again, and her room has been disheveled. Clothing and other items are strewn about. Willa blames Gina, but she can't prove anything. Before going to sleep at the end of the day, though, Willa Big barricades her door. Yeah, she moves her dresser in front of her door, which I'm like, damn, this girl's strong. Uh, <laughs> However, she wakes up to find her room completely wrecked the next day. Many of her favorite items and toys have been destroyed. Willa sees Mr. Teddy, and he is holding a doll's arm. Yeah. Uh, Willa runs to her mother and blames Gina, but Willa's mother informs her that Gina had been in a sleepover all night. Ooh. Willa sprints to her room and tears apart Mr. Teddy, throwing his remains out a window. Willa retrieves Old Bear, her original teddy bear. As Willa hugs Old Bear, she doesn't see the smile form on his face. Old Bear won't let himself be replaced, and he hopes that Willa has learned her lesson. Okay. Starting off... Start, starting off, this story is not that scary. But GD, man. Like, like, let's not lie to ourselves. I even said it in the middle. It felt kind of like a rehash of Night of the Living Dummy. But you know what? It's different enough that it, it worked out. Okay. Um, but God, when we get close to that finale, when we get to that finale and Gina was at a sleepover and couldn't have wrecked Willa's room, that moment is just, it's just so creepy. And like... That's that's what I like to call the calls coming from inside the house moment. Like it's literally the 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 the, the Jaws moment when uh, what's his face? You know, I'll I'll put the clip right here. But like when it's got that weird zoom effect right there, that's the effect right there for for uh, Willa. Like it's it's amazing. 
Like, I've read this story more than once, but that moment always gets me. I always am like, holy shit, holy shit, the call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> uh, and honestly, I have to read the, f I have to read that, that final part on page 92. Like, Willa didn't see the pleased smile form on Old Bear's mouth. She didn't see his eyes begin to twinkle merrily. Next time, Old Bear thought to himself, maybe you won't be so quick to get rid of me. Willa, maybe you've learned your lesson. You can't put me away on a shelf. Not me. I'm your bear. And I'm going to be with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Fucking creepy. <laughs> um, that's creepy. It's good. It's scary. It gets me every time, man. It's written... It's just very well written. And why is this story not scary? Well, the whole Mr. Teddy moving and things around her moving in disarray isn't that scary. Especially when the red herring Gina... When they red herring Gina so much. Like, the poor girl just gets red herring. It's so sad. She, she gets more red herring than red herring himself. Yeah. Uh, final verdict... I think if this story could take all the spooks and thrills from the last two pages and stretch it out to the entire story, this would be a much scarier story. But, that conclusion is just so freaking good that Mr. Teddy skyrockets to too scary for me. It's going to be on the lower end of too scary for me, but it skyrockets to too scary for me. It is good. I love that ending. It's so good. Like, you get there and you're just like, oh, it's good stuff. Click. Oh, click. Not the Adam Sandler movie. I bet that joke's gotten old. Ah. Uh, Seth Gold loves channel surfing. When his dad brings home a universal remote that he bought at a small store, Seth is thrilled. Seth begins to use the remote, but his younger sister, Megan, tries to take it away. While fighting for the remote, the kids launch it across the room. Megan leaves and Seth inspects the remote. It seems to still work. Seth's mom comes in and yells at him for hugging the remote and not doing chores and his homework. Seth points the remote at her and presses mute. Shockingly, it works. During dinner, Seth eats dessert, but he uses the rewind function to eat dessert multiple times. It's kind of gross. During school the next day, Seth uses the pause function to allow himself to cheat on a test. He continues to use the remote to improve his life throughout the, his school day. Seth mutes a lunch lady, but he finds himself unable to unmute her. A kid named Danny Wexler tries to steal the remote, and Seth ends up pausing him. Kids begin to panic, and the principal steps in. Seth freezes her, and more kids notice. As kids shout at him and chase him, he feels panicked. In desperation, he presses the power button. Seth finds himself in a dark void. He looks at the remote and sees a blinking light. Signaling a dead battery. Womp womp. Why is this one scary? Having the power of a god in the palm of your hands feels like a cool idea. But as Seth finds out, it's a real nightmare when it stops working. That's a good, it's a good spook. Uh, when the whole lunchroom starts chasing Seth, like, just the description of them being like, what? Like, they're all yelling at him. They're all clamoring. They're all like, get him! Get him! And it's just, it gets creepy. It's its a good moment, honestly. And, it, I don't know, it gets your blood pumping. Like, it gets that, like, fear response going. At least for me, it got my fear response going. Um, and GD, man, like, the ending is so bleak. Like, it's such a brutal ending for him. Like, it, 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 it's what a lot of people would describe as a I have no mouth and I must scream kind of moment of just, like, you're stuck in a void of nothingness and there's no going back. It's a good friggin' ending. But I have some complaints here of why this one isn't scary. All the remote tomfoolery. It was pretty gross starting off with the whole pudding shit. But, uh, it's really annoying during the classroom where he's, like, turning up the volume when, like, the teacher squeaks the thing. Uh, muting or, oh god, what? He's, like, he muted the teacher and unmuted the teacher and, like, fast-forwarded. It's just, it was just getting annoying. It was just, just, eh. It's word fill. Definitely word fill. <laughs> Final verdict, though. I honestly groaned when I saw that this story was in this collection, but upon rereading it, I liked it. 
and thought it had some good moments of thrills and chills. I think it's a bit of an uneven story, especially with all the hijinks, they get really obnoxious, and the final moment is such a such a good, creepy moment. Like, it's so good. Like, I gotta rate this one as a mild goosebumps achieved. If it had less, less shenanigans in there, I think... I think it'd be a little higher. I think it'd be in the kind of creepy, but just didn't work out that way. I'm putting it at the top of my mouth. Goose was achieved, though, just for that ending. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff, indeed. Broken Dolls. Tamara Baker's little brother, Neil, is always trying to break her dolls. One day, Tamara's parents are taking the both of them to a craft fair. While looking around, she spots a section filled with handmade and very lifelike dolls. Tamara meets the old woman who made the dolls, who later gives Neil a cookie. When they leave, Tamara starts to notice that Neil is acting unusually quiet and still. He then gets a fever and Tamara finds some weird kind of goop in his hair, which he calls Dolly Jelly. Later, Neil begins to mumble something about not wanting to become a doll. Tamara realizes that the old woman at the fair must have been responsible for Neil's affliction and heads back to the fairgrounds. She sneaks into the woman's trailer and finds several boxes of dolls without faces. One of the dolls has Dolly Jelly in his hair, and Tamara sees that his face is becoming that of Neil's. Soon, the other dolls come to life and try to attack her until she gets cornered by the old woman. She takes out a jar filled with Dolly Jelly and plans to turn Tamara into a doll as well. Only Tamara takes the jelly jar, jelly jar, jelly jar, and throws it into a pool of water. The old woman shrieks and and she vanishes. Tamara hears the dolls cheer as the doll of Neil is now blank. She ran out of out of there and when she gets home she discovers that Neil is back to normal. A few weeks later, Tamara's res <clears throat> a few weeks later, Tamara receives a package in the mail containing a doll version of the old woman. Tamara then dares her brother to break it. <laughs> Why is this one scary? The first time Dolly Jelly is mentioned is just so ominous and unpleasant. He's like whispering it, Dolly Jelly. And like just that whisper, it's so unnatural and brings it. And just the idea of Dolly Jelly is just so gross. It's like petroleum jelly, but evil. Evil jelly. Ooh. Something evil. Um, when Tamara finds the doll that is slowly gaining the features of Neil in the trailer, that image will haunt me. Yes, indeed. Just slowly gaining his features. It's, ugh, it's so creepy. Um, the moment with the closet that she finds all these dolls. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and read the excerpt on page 115. As long as I can find it. Stop her. A voice said. Tamara gasped and spun around. Was it the old doll maker? No. No one was at the trailer door. Where did the sound come from? The closet. Stop her. A tiny voice repeated. Swallowing hard, Tamara pulled open the closet door with a trembling hand. Dolls crammed into the shelves. The dolls from the crafts fair. But they couldn't be dolls because they were moving, reaching out their tiny, tiny pink arms to Tamara. No! Tamara shrieked. You can't be alive. You, you can't be. She shrank back from their outstretched arms. Freaking creepy. That closet is creepy. That's that's some good imagery there. Uh, and then there's a specific line on page 115 that really messed me up. I'm not gonna lie. This this is this line is what messed me up out of the story. I think it's time for you to go away, dearie. The old lady said quietly. Young people disappear so often in this century. You'll just be one more. That is a fucked up thing to say. Like, holy crap, is that fucked up. Okay, now... There's only one part of the story that I would say isn't super scary, but it's... It, it's a double-edged sword moment for me. Initially, the ending is quite frightening, as Tamara is frozen in fear that this old woman has found her, and, like, it, it, she's there with them. But when she is like, hey, Neil, I dare you to break this doll, I couldn't help but cackle. I was cackling like a mad baby. Like, mad baby. Ooh, babies don't cackle, do they? I was cackling like a wild witch. Yeah. 
Final verdict, without a doubt, this is probably the scariest story in this collection. There's just something about dolls that make me feel uneasy to begin with. Then the old lady's words to Tamara being like, Oh, you'll just be another statistic, dear. Man, this is a good story. Like, top of the list. Too scary for me. <sighs> Scariest story, without a doubt. Alright, final story. A vampire in the neighborhood. Uh, the new girl in school, Helga Nugenstrom, Nugenstorm, is strange. She is pale and wears very antiquated clothes. During lunch, Maddie Simmon and her friends Carrie, Yvonne, and Joey are discussing Helga. Maddie offers to let Helga sit with them, but Helga declines. She says she doesn't eat lunch. The four friends all decide that she must be a vampire. The friends choose to investigate Helga, so they spy on her house over the course of several days. Whenever they try to talk to her at school, she, dis she dismisses them. Man, I can't talk. When Maddie grabs Helga's hand, she feels that it is incredibly cold. The group goes to her house one night, and they try to see if she sleeps in the coffin. When Maddie looks through a window, Helga is staring back at her. Helga storms outside. She tells the group to stop following her. Maddie asks if Helga is a vampire. Helga says yes, but asks it to see the other kids' fangs first. The other kids let their fangs sink down. Shocked. Helga explains that she was joking. The group of four close in around her, preparing to make her a vampire. Ooh. Why is this one scary? That ending reveal of the kids being the vampires and not her... It's a good twist on the uh, the neighbor. My neighbor's a vampire trope. Pretty grim ending for poor Helga, but good spooky time for kid for everyone else. Why isn't it scary? I think the kids are a little too obsessed with this goth girlfriend. <laughs> Why would I say goth girl? I mean, she is a goth girl. She's described as being a goth girl. Like, let's not lie to ourselves. She's goth, and they're way too obsessed with her. Like, they're way too obsessed. Uh, my final verdict is I don't find this one too frightening. It's honestly a slog to read through and takes too long to get to the reveal at the end. The stalking sections could have been cut down and the reveal appeared sooner and we could have had an interesting chase with the kids hunting poor Helga down and like her being like being like held down and then them sinking their teeth right into her. Like something spooky. Like it ends on a grim note. Can we get a little bit more though? That's all I asked for. I find this one to be a yawn. <sighs> <sighs> Yan. All right, that's it right there. That's the list. No more list. No more list ever again. That's a lie. No, no. I'll keep making lists. I'll gladly. Uh, next time I'm gonna be reading more tales to give you goosebumps, and then after that, even more tales, and after that, this one, and then this one, and then. Last one, which I might save for Christmas in all honesty, because it's it's Christmas stories. And I don't have to make the list for that because uh, uh at yeah bro nice, uh you're awesome for making that for spongy. <laughs> uh, well if you liked what you saw, hey, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. I kinda wanna know what your guys' ratings would be. Like, would you say that Broken Dolls is in fact the scariest story on this one? Or maybe you think Strain Bees is actually the scariest one on here. Because babies, babies be scary. I don't know. I, I like, I think I firmly think this might be the official list for everyone. Uh, I don't, I don't know where I'm getting that from, but I firmly think it is. <laughs> Doesn't matter to anybody. Uh, thank you for joining me this time around. Like, subscribe. Hey, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash speaking of which, where you can get episodes like this early. You can get my notes. I will be posting my notes of this on there for everyone to be like, oh, so that's what he thinks about these. He seems kind of crazy. Those are some weird words he uses. Subliminal. That's a word he never used. Until right there. Uh, thank you for joining me, and you guys, stay spooky.